You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 9, 2016, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Principles of Food Challenges. Our presenter is Dr. Maya Nando. She's an assistant professor in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. As most of you know, I'm an allergist here, um, who my, or my primary interest is food allergy. So today I'm going to be going over with you guys some of the principles of oral food challenges. And I think all of you guys have been involved at this point, right, with food challenges. I don't know, Madeline, if you've been through it. Um, but so here are some specifics um, on how to do a challenge. So some of the pre test questions um, that we'll review at the end. Um, I think you guys all got a copy, right? So a peanut value of a 20 kilounit per liter um, specific IgE to a peanut um, and a seven-year-old child is an absolute counterindication to performing an oral food challenge, true or false. Um, two, what type of food challenge is indicated if there is high concern for subject and observer bias? So an open food challenge, single-blinded or double-blinded placebo control. Three, the typical observation time after an FPI, which is food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, challenge is four hours, true or false. And then lastly, after a negative or a past oral food challenge, approximately 25% of patients do not reintroduce the food into their diet, true or false. So um, I can send this, I was just telling Hanny, I can send this uh, in an email to you guys if you haven't seen it already, the work group report um, uh, by Anna Novak um, and other um, prominent members in the food allergy field um, came together on this consensus of indications. So I pretty much go through the article in this lecture and also pull in from other resources. But this is a great um, reference point. Um, so we'll go through what are the indications for an oral food challenge in clinic, um, what are the risks and benefits, what are the different types, how you decide on location and food preparation, um, what's the dosing schedule including the initial dose, how to monitor the reaction, when to stop the food challenge, and also briefly touch on treatment, um, and then how to interpret the outcome and post challenge information for the family. Um, so indications, things that you've already know, you know, uh, why we do a food challenge. What's the most common reason we do a food challenge in clinic, what do you think? To reintroduce the food if we think it's not an allergy. Right, resolution of food allergy is probably the most common reason. For initial diagnosis, that is a reason to do it, but often if they have a clear clinical history, positive testing, it's, you know, you're putting the patient at risk for a reaction, we don't often need to. But if there's an unclear history, some low positive testing, um, or if it's you know a <laughs> additive or a food dye, we may you know want to confirm the diagnosis um, in our clinic and bring them in and do it. Um, then in chronic conditions like atopic dermatitis or um, eosinophilic esophagitis, um, kids will have um, delayed reactions to the food. So and, um, the food allergen in your esophagus can induce eosinophilia in EOE. Um, also, maybe some food allergens can induce um, some delayed reactions like atopic derm, but do they have immediate reactions? So the question in those kids is, challenge them in clinic um, to see if it's just delayed or if there is an immediate component. Some patients will be on, have subjective complaints to lots of foods, so they have multi, uh, multiple dietary restrictions and they're complaining of odd things like hyperactivity or headaches, and so you may want to do um, objective food challenges to kind of tease those out too. Cross-reactive foods is also a reason, so a lot of people will say um, peanuts and tree nuts, there's about 30% cross-reactivity between the two, um, and so you'll test for it, but they've never had a reaction or they never had symptoms and the family is interested um, in doing a tree nut challenge in a peanut allergic child, that is something that you can do. Um, and we'll talk about specifics about the problems of doing individual nuts. Um, and then food processing on tolerability. So good example of this is baked milk, baked egg challenges. Um, some kids who are egg or milk allergic may um, tolerate the baked forms of that, and so that would be a first step for them when challenging. Uh, and also um, oral allergy syndrome. So kids typically, you know, parents feel comfortable they've eaten the cooked form of apples um, or other fruits, and so they continue at home, but there is about a 
1%, depending on the study, you read risk of anaphylaxis. Um, so they may feel more comfortable doing that in your clinic um, for the raw form. So what are some of the risks and benefits um, of the food challenge? We touched on some of this, and you always want to discuss this with the family before you bring them in, um, and also document it, too, that you've had this discussion about risks and benefits. Um, so and this is of a positive um, or a failed food challenge. So the risk is an acute allergic reaction. They come in and they may have mild reaction of hives or swelling, um, but they may also have a potential life-threatening anaphylaxis where you may have to give epi or a few doses of epi. And, um, in, in patients who have a severe history of anaphylaxis, they're more at risk too. In the, in the literature, there's been no reports of death since 1976, um, but there has been a report. I tried looking that up, um, what was cited, but I couldn't find it. Um, also, they can have, you know, emotional distress. It is, you know, you tell a child their entire life that they're food allergic and then their testing may turn negative, but the child still feels allergic. So there's significant emotional distress in these kids, so that needs to be addressed too, and they might not want to do the challenge for that reason. Some of the benefits is, um, of the failed challenge, so of reacting, is that you get a conclusive diagnosis. So in the end, families um, sometimes feel happy that they know kind of what may happen um, and also that they have a, di a clear diagnosis um, and it validates their efforts in avoiding. Unfortunately, we can't say that this is the reaction that they're going to have every time. It can vary based on the amount of food that they eat and as we know, it's not predictive. Their, their reactions can change from one time to another time. Some of the reasons that you may want to defer or not do the oral food challenge in somebody um, is that they have a high likelihood of a reaction. So, you know, they had a recent episode of anaphylaxis or they have a, a specific IG um, and skin prick test that's greater than the 95th um, decision point plus the clinical history. Um, the age of a child might be limiting where they're in the first two years of life and difficult to assess if they're really reacting or not. If they have unstable asthma or any other medical conditions that may um, make their reaction worse or make it more difficult to treat them. Um, and then really the, the specific IgE and skin prick testing values are never an absolute indication or contraindication for doing a food challenge. We do use those levels um, to, to determine their eligibility, but you always have to take it in the clinical context. Um, and we do have good the 95% positive decision points for certain foods. I'll show you that slide later in kids, but and we use that in adults also. But there's really the literature was all done. The studies were done in children, so we just use the same markers for adults too. So that's really unclear. Unclear in Europe, they use the 99th um, percent positive decision point, and um, of and anybody below that may be eligible for a food challenge. They're kind of more stringent in who they um, uh, uh, challenge. And then the literature is always evolving. You know, we use certain cutoff values that have been established, um, but if you read different cohort studies, there are different values that are listed. So we use, you know, 15 for uh, or 14 for peanut as our gold standard value of the 95 percent decision point, but you have to take into account what population that was done in. Um, those were atopic, you know, kids with eczema, um, and it was kids, and it was eczema kids. Applying that to the entire population is difficult, so you, you know, you have to keep that in mind. Um, and our values, just because they're peanut specific IgE is 70, does not predict the severity of the reaction. So it can be scary, but if that's all era H8, and they are maybe tolerant, you can still do the challenge. You really have to take in the clinical history. The risk assessment. Um, so in this chart, and it's pretty straightforward, so somebody who's low risk of reaction is somebody who recently ingested a small amount of the food and didn't have any symptoms. Um, favorable test results, which we'll talk about. They're high risk of reaction. They had a recent reaction in the past six to 12 months. Or if they have the high positive test results, which we'll talk about. And then severe reaction. Um, if the, they have no history of severe reaction or the food is usually not indicated in a severe reaction, what are the foods that are typically indicated in a more severe reaction? Peanuts, peanuts, fish, shellfish. Yep. Um, and they have no history of asthma. So you consider that child to be less um, or lower risk. And then vice versa for um, the severe reactions. And then any other condition um, that makes 
resuscitation of a severe reaction, so if they have difficult access or a difficult airway, um, if they have cardiovascular disease and the beta blockers like you hear about. And access can be little kids, so it's something to consider. Um, so these are, you know, the often cited positive and negative decision points. So for milk um, greater than 15, um, if you're older than age one, if you're younger than age one, um, five is our cutoff, and this is the serum-specific IgE to milk. And um, so 95% of children above this level will um, react in that in that study. Um, and egg white, um, the positive decision point was seven. Um, units per liter to the egg if you're older than age two. If you're younger than age two, then greater than two. And then peanut was 14 and fish was 20. So we usually use this 50% negative decision point to determine when to do the challenge. It's kind of equivalent to flipping a coin, right? So if you're less than two for milk, less than two for egg, less than two for peanut, um, with a clinical history, um, you, you they may be eligible for doing a challenge. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the um, uh, peanut, I believe it's two, mm -hmm. so do you look at the RH2 only or do you just look at the total? So this is based, these cutoffs are based on the whole peanut specific IgE. RH2 um, is a predictor of clinical reactivity, but the problem is, is and there's been different cutoffs cited, uh, and I've seen cutoffs listed as 0 0.2, 0 0.9, 1.5 is your 95% decision point for RH2. Say, There's been various ones, 0 0.2, 0 0.35, oh. and one study was 100%, and then I think 1.2, 1.3 was another cutoff. So they varied in different studies. Um, but the whole peanut, you know, may be more predictive. It's, it's tough. I've had a few kids who their whole peanut was less than 2, but then their area age 2 was elevated. What do you do in those situations? There's no good answer. Um, I think you can still go by clinical history, and if their whole peanut is less than 2, so if your clinical history is wimpy and you're not really sure, and their whole peanut is less than 2, I would say you can go for and offer that kid a challenge. Um, so we really shouldn't, at least at this point, we should not necessarily do component panel testing in patients who we deem to be candidates for an oral food challenge. So I don't think RH2 is what you're going to use as a cutoff for oral, oral food challenge if at, right off the bat. So if you get a whole peanut specific IgE back and it's elevated, it's, you know, 10 or, you know, it's, it's greater than 2. Um, then I would say it might help tease out which ones you may go go forward with the challenge or not. Because it's those kids who are very pollen allergic um, who will then be sensitized to error H8 that I see may be eligible for the challenges. Does that make sense? So they have, you know, a peanut specific IgE of 15 and they're very pollen allergic. So then I do component testing and I see it's all error H8 and they're not error H1, 2, 3. So I say then you're probably just going to have local like oral allergy syndrome um, symptoms. We can challenge you. Does that make sense? So I don't do it off the bat on every patient. Sure, but, but then I guess what number would you look at for the 213 as being so if you do component testing, and that's the difficult part, is pretty much if it's positive, then it prohibits challenge because there's been so many studies to show that even a level of H2 down to 0.2 is, can be your 95% positive decision point. Um, and then here are your, um, and then also take into account that your cutoff may be different if they've never eaten the food before. So if they have no history of reaction, then you can, may even, or they've never eaten the food before, um, you can use a higher cutoff level, level five for peanuts. Um, so we kind of talked about a little bit of this already. So a 12-year-old child with a history of generalized urticaria after ingestion of peanut at age five, who has a peanut IgE level of 17 kilograms per liter and recently ingested accidentally one to two teaspoons, that's a big accident, of peanut butter <laughs> without a reaction. Would you offer them a challenge or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes you a little uncomfortable, right, with the high testing, but if they've had an actual ingestion with that volume, then they may be able to tolerate with larger volumes. The cutoff of five if they've never eaten it, sorry, why would that have been checked? Like if they've never eaten it, a lot of people well, like yeah. Checked. Okay, yeah. There's well, not a reason why you would have checked it. Mm -mm. This okay. saying that if you've had, you know, incidental, you know, someone has they tested have the it. Full panel. Got it. Okay. Um. 
And so now we have a 12-year-old child with a peanut IgE of 5 and a recent, in the past six months, anaphylactic reaction of using or carrying emesis to a small amount of peanut butter. Would you offer them or defer it? Sure. Yeah, and these are really straightforward, right? In real life, it's a lot messier than this. Um, but, you know, these are ones that we can kind of use. All right, so what are the different types of oral food challenge? Um, so open, blinded, and multiple foods. Um, so open is what we typically do. It's unmasked feeding of the food in its natural form. It's typically done in an office setting. It's a simplified protocol of gradual feeding with an age-appropriate serving, um, and it's usually followed by a one to two hour observation period. Some of the benefits is it's a natural exposure of the food. You're giving regular milk or peanut butter. Um, it's also time, um, it's cost and time effective too. The problem is there is a high risk of bias because we know that we're giving them the food and the family and the child knows. So they can complain of some subjective symptoms. We also may see um, be more on alert because we're giving the food too. Single blinded, so there's different ways you can do this. Is you can do it. The so single blinded means that the family and the child doesn't know um, that if they're getting the food or they're getting some other vehicle like just applesauce. Um, but the but the provider knows, so the physician or the nurse practitioner knows. Um, you can do it with a placebo. So either one day you'll do peanut butter and then the next day you'll do just applesauce or somehow mask it. Um, or even you might do it two hours after the first session if the child is doing okay and they actually can eat a light lunch and then wait two hours and do the second session. Um, and, you can, and if you don't do a placebo day, then you're pretty much telling them you might get the food, you might not get the food. We may give you cow's milk, we may give you soy milk, we don't know. Um, and then, and um, or if you're doing multiple foods on that day, you know you can do tell not tell them the sequence. So in the morning might be milk, and the afternoon might be soy milk or flip flops, and they don't know. Um, if you do have a negative challenge, so they pass it, they have no symptoms, um, then they, it is recommended that you do an open feeding two hours later or on a separate day because there is a small chance that a three percent of kids who may still react even after that gradual escalation. Um, the benefits is there a lower risk of bias, but the observer, so the um, provider has to be careful about their attitude. If you're very vigilant during the, you know, cow milk challenge, but then very laid back during the soy, then they might pick up on something. Um, the risks are um, observer bias, like I mentioned, and then um, if you have a positive challenge and it's blinded, they say maybe you should go on and to do a, um, a double blinded, just again to reduce the bias. Now, double-blinded placebo-controlled is the gold standard of food challenges, but um, it's very rigorous and time-consuming and costly. So it's often used in the research setting, and maybe in select clinical cases where you think that there is a really high um, concern for observer and patient bias, you may do a double-blinded. Um, challenge. Typically, if you're going to do in the office setting, it's a single blinded and you may do a placebo day and a non-placebo day or in a food day. Um, and you have a third party who prepares the food and, um, and brings it to you. Um, after, and then after you do both of the challenges, then you break the code and you discuss the results with the family of which day was what and what symptoms they had. Um, and then same thing, if they have a negative challenge, um, then you still have to go forward and just do an open feeding for the food too. Um, so multiple food challenges um, is debated and um, when to do this and how to do this. Um, if there's no history um, of delayed reactions greater than two hours, then you can do this. But if there is a history of delayed reactions, then this would not be appropriate because you're doing lots of foods um, back to back. Um, if you do it open or single blinded, um, or else you challenge to one food, you can do it on the same day, but you have to do it at least two hours apart, like I mentioned before. Typically, this is done for the, tr the cross-reactive foods. So, you know, there's tree nuts, shellfish, or fish. So you can just bring in one nut or one shrimp or one catfish, um, but it's really unclear then, are they going to tolerate the rest or not? Within the different species of fish, there's about 60% cross-reactivity between the different species of shellfish. There's about 75% risk cross-reactivity, and then the tree nuts, it varies based on the nuts. Um, I've seen before for the tree nuts that you take the different types of nuts. Um, you can take, you know, four of the seven or three of the major seven, 
grind them up and then um, give it in increasing doses. Maybe you can mask, try to mask it in applesauce or another vehicle if they don't want to eat the um, flour or the dust that you've grinded up. Or you can do it in sequence. At first you do a quick buildup of cashew, then after that you do a buildup of pecan, and after that you do a buildup of walnut. Um, if you, um, if you have a pistachio and a cashew allergy, can you just simply give one? I think they're cross-reacting, right? So mm -hmm. can you just give one and assume that the other one? Not technically. Technically, no. You really, the best, you know, to know if you're truly allergic or not, you need to challenge to that one directly. That's why the benefit of doing this of all at one time. So doing back-to-back -back or grinding it together and doing it. Um, the, the downside of this is that you might not be able to reach the recommended dose because it is a high volume that you're going to need of those nuts. And so if you're doing lots of nuts, they might not be able to eat that much that day. So you may have to choose three nuts that day that you do or two um, shellfish that you do. And you may still need several sessions, but just not as many. The other downside is if you mix it all up, you don't know what you reacted to. So you could just have reacted to the cashew, but then you have to avoid all of them. Well, they're avoiding all of them to begin with. So they still see it as a benefit, as, as possibly a benefit that they may pass all of them. Um, if, and so like I said, yeah, avoiding all the cross-reactive, and then if they do fail, then you may consider doing them all individual separately. Um, location and food prep preparation. So where to do the challenge. So office setting versus hospital setting. So the decision factors you use to determine that. So first you want to determine their risk. So if it's a low risk patient with, who's cooperative, it's suitable for office. And we kind of talked about that before of what's low risk. I probably should have put this one here. But you know, no prior um, reaction um, and then they're, they're testing also um, being within the acceptable range, having no asthma um, and no, and I said no prior severe reaction. If they're high risk, if they have any of those um, symptoms uh, or history, then it's based on your clinical judgment. If you can do it in the office setting, you want to consider your support staff. Um, do you have enough people to manage a severe reaction? How far are you from the hospital? Um, you know, mass response time if you're in the outpatient setting, and then office preparedness to treat anaphylaxis. Um, if they're very high risk, that's when you're thinking hospital setting or ICU setting. Um, some of the practical aspects of doing, and this is really probably for more outpatient, um, you know, individual clinics, is uh, do they have? Do you have the staff to prepare the food and minister and monitor appropriately? Um, and and then also your risk assessment is based on their prior type of reaction and severity of reaction, and the timing if it was delayed or immediate. So food preparation in general, you want to prepare it with any cross contact with any other foods. You want to prepare in a sanitary fashion, um, preferably a single ingredient, but there are um, exceptions to this. So meaning if you're doing an egg challenge, you just cook that egg and give it, but there are some uh, things you can do. Um, you want to make sure it's the rawness that you want if you're doing baked egg, or that should be, yeah, baked egg versus regular egg. and discussing that with the family for pollen allergy, are you doing the raw food? Um, and then also form the food that's tailored to their preference. If they come here and they don't like it, they're not going to eat it. Um, and then if it's an open food challenge, the, food, the family brings it in. If it's a blinded, then the physician's office has to um, prepare it to mask it. So ways to mask it in these blinded um, Setting. So I kind of just wrote the basics down here in infants, applesauce and infant formula are typical. Um, for other things, um, so for the flowers down here, um, the vehicles up here may be used, so milk, egg, peanut, soy, wheat, flowers, all these flowers are available. <coughs> and you can try to mask it in oatmeal, chocolate pudding, milk smoothie, all these things. Um, meats are the tough ones to mask. Meat, you know, you might want to use canned tuna for that. So if you're doing like a shrimp challenge or something like that, then um, tuna might be a good way to mask it. <laughs> um, and then, and then there's debate on the spices. You know, some people, you know, really just want it to be as straightforward as possible, just that food, nothing added. Um, you know, but you may, for masking purposes, you do have to add something, and for taste, you will have to add something. 
some of the limitations um, to masking is that you have to be creative about how to mask it. And then also the placebo, um, you don't want them to be able to identify which day is a placebo, which day is not. So if you're adding peanut flour one day to applesauce and you have to do the next day some sort of flour that you're adding to that wheat flour or um, something that maybe is similar, it's hard to mask that peanut butter taste. So that is the toughest. Um, sometimes that large volume of the challenge, so if you're using, you know, 100 uh, grams or mLs of applesauce and putting in that, um, that wheat flour and it gets gummy, you know, that's difficult for them to eat that large volume. Um, and then the effect is uh, food processing, so if you're cooking or baking something and then adding it in, maybe it'll change the food matrix of it when you add that flour in. Sorry to be asking so many No, no, go ahead. It's a really useful talk. Um, those spices and flavors, are they all non-allergenic like maple syrup or do you still have to ask about pollen sensitivities? And um, So I'm not an expert in the masking. I've, I've only done it a few times, but in, in a Novak paper where they've done a lot of the blinded challenges, this is what they recommend in using. So it makes me think that it's less likely um, to cause any reactions. I mean, they do talk about in the paper, and I don't, I took it out of this talk about additives and being careful of avoiding things that have carmine, annatto, sulfite, things that we know can cause reactions. So you want to try to avoid any fruit juice that contains that or, you know, something that may have something else in it. So that's why they give you these basic things that should be tolerated. They And then they say, like, and I'll bring that up maybe um, in a little bit, um, about for eggs. So some children do not want to eat eggs. And so French toast is an option for them where you cook it and, you know, it's still pretty um, gooey in the middle, so you think it's still raw that they should react if they eat it. But obviously they have to be wheat tolerant. So you can't, you know, you have to make sure it's the appropriate vehicle. Um, so dosing schedule. So total dose that you want to get to during gradual escalation. So for dry foods, about 8 to 10 grams. For meat or fish, 16 to 20 grams. Wet food, 100 ml. So wet food would be milk, meat or fish, shrimp or catfish. Dry food is maybe the wheat. Um, and then you may have to adjust this based on their age. So um, ideally, you know, 8 ounces. Um, of milk will give you the amount of protein that you need, but in a young baby, you might not get there. You know, five to six may be sufficient. Then we increase the increments every 15 minutes. Um, you may want to do longer increments if it's a patient who has a history of delayed onset reactions. Um, and the re and I don't mention it here, but um, maybe I do later, that when they come in on empty stomach, the reason why we say empty stomach is because it aids with um, gastric emptying so that, you know, if they're going to have a reaction, it should be pretty quickly within that 15 minutes. If they have a full belly full of food, it'll take time for that reaction to hit later. Um, so if they have no, and then again, we don't always do this, but a lot of the recommendations I was reading through do say this, that if they have no symptoms during the escalation, an age-appropriate serving in its natural form may be served at the end. Typically what happens is by the time you get to the end of the challenge, that last dose of your challenge is usually a pretty age-appropriate serving size um, when you're divvying it up. Um, this table is great in this paper. I look at it all the time to remind me of uh, this. Uh, sorry, I didn't cite it, but it's that Anna Novak um, work group paper um, of what options you have for milk. So yogurt, you can do also. I would avoid fruit yogurt. You know, it really should be plain. Um, and cottage cheese, hard cheese, I don't know about, but these other forms I think are good. Um, soy beverage, if they don't like it, you know, tofu. Edam I always think, why not just do edamame, and we don't have um, a, an amount up here, but I'm sure we can calculate it if it's an older child. Um, it is a choking risk, you can't really do it for young kids. Um, maybe even cooked beans have enough soy in it. And then this is the egg, doing the French toast, one slice of French toast. Um, one egg uh, per one slice, or doing the scrambles of boils. And then you have lots of options for wheat, um, and um, it also gives you kind of your dosing for peanut butter, two tablespoons. Um, for nuts, you know, they say 25 to 30 pieces. You know, that, I think that's on the higher end to get to 30, 40 grams, but um, I, I think probably you could use less depends on the, the nut it is. Um, 
and then seeds and veggies. So anyways, it's a, it's a great table to go through to see what your total dose should be. Um, when you look at the protein content, this comes in more for f size challenges when you're calculating the protein content of how much you have to give them during that um, f size challenge. Um, but I think it's good to know also, in, in the research studies, we talk about it too, of what dose uh, of peanut protein will the child react to. And in the egg um, and milk OIT um, studies too, that they talk about the amount of protein um, that will cause the reaction. So in general, so one tablespoon of peanut butter is about 4.6 grams of peanut protein. Um, and so you have a conversion for peanut flour too. So if two tablespoons is your serving size, you can calculate how much peanut flour you would need to match the same amount of um, protein. So that would be a full dough. So 10 grams, so maybe about double, so about 18 grams probably, just doing the math off the fly, would be your total dose that you want to reach for escalation. Um, this is an example that they give for a wheat challenge and how to calculate your dose. So they say weigh out the 10 grams of wheat flour, so two, two, two teaspoons of the wheat flour, mix in some sugar, so it's palatable probably, um, mix, and then mix in the applesauce for a total weight of 100 grams. And they use 100 grams just to make it easy so that you can do you divide it out, right, do the math easily. Um, and then they, you know, they do a lot of steps. The first dose they do is really low. Um, of 0.1 grams of the total challenge food, which is only 0.01 um, grams. Uh, so was that 1,000 milligrams? Um, That's Dr. Dowling quality low. Yeah. So in Europe, they do it this low also. But you also have to think about who they're challenging. You know, they're challenging those kids who are at the 99% positive decision point. So it makes sense in them to start at the really low dose. If you're challenging, and, and this is where the initial dose I'll talk about, there's a range because it depends on that child too and the reason why you're doing the challenge are you trying to see what their threshold dose is so then you start really low or are you trying to see resolution of allergy and you might start higher um, so and like and this is multi-step so it, it I think this is just a more rigorous form of it um, I, I did just Oh, and this wasn't a paper, but this is typically what we do for a baked milk, baked egg challenge, where you have that muffin and you start with one 30-second portion of the muffin, and when you're cutting it out, it actually looks like a bigger chunk than you think it is, and I actually had started with a smaller um, piece at first, and then one sixteenth, one eighth, one quarter, one half, um, and you're pretty much up to the full serving by the end of it, and you can see you're through it in an hour, and then you observe for two hours. Um, I gave an example of something typically that we do for peanut butter. You do the lick, or what we do here, um, one sixteenth of a teaspoon, one eighth, one quarter, one half, one teaspoon, one tablespoon, and this probably gets you about to two tablespoons, maybe a little under. And then I gave the amount of <coughs> peanut butter um, in milligrams and what the equivalent peanut butter protein is. I just did a math quickly. It's about a third um, of it. So in research studies, you start at one milligram of peanut protein, and you can see that we're starting way higher than that. Maybe that lick is 30, but so variable. It's hard to say how much that is. Um, so again, it just comes down to the reason why you're doing this challenge. For f challenges to so the food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, um, remember symptoms are delayed um, typically two to four hours after, and um, some people cite once four hours after ingestion. Um, you want to consider having an IV in place because the primary treatment for these kids is hydration um, and getting some baseline labs to that you want to compare to if they do react. Um, and again, usually the reason why you do the challenge is for resolution. We usually don't do it for initial diagnosis. If FIs, most of them resolve by age two or three, and they come in to ensure. So you do three feedings of the foods over 45 minutes, um, and you calculate um, the grams of protein per kilogram of body weight um, based on that chart I showed you before, um, and to see how much they will eat total, and then divide it into those three portions. Um, if they have a previous history of a severe reaction that they were, you know, admitted to the ICU and um, needed um, multiple boluses or something like that, then you can do a lower dose. Um, you want to observe them for four hours because, like I said, they have that delayed reaction, so you want to um, observe them for a longer time. And then, um, they, you know, some of the papers will say consider giving a single serving size um, after you're done with the four hours and then observing again for two to three hours, just ensure that they will get that 
full dose or intolerate that full dose. But I know Dr. Jelling has mentioned a few times that, um, and I haven't heard the lecture, but Matt Greenhot, who does some research in um, food allergy, has said that they've done a lot of challenges about that last size, uh, that last serving dose, and those kids, the kids have done well. So, and that applies just to clarify: ten grams off the food of concern is an adequate challenge. At that point. That's, yeah, this is based on the paper. You know, I usually do the, my calculations of 0.3 grams protein per kilo, you know, and I, I don't remember if they ever heard that 10 grams of the food or not. Um, but, yeah. Even they, less than the all food challenge that they meet, right, for our fish or meat, because that's 16 to 20 grams. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but to the dry food, it's equivalent to what the dry food would be. Um, so, and then this, they just, I won't go through it all, but they give a similar um, explanation of how to calculate it out. So if you need help with how to do it, what their weight is, and they give an example of how to do it. So how do you determine your initial dose? Like we talked about, you know, there's a lot of considerations of what's their, you know, risk of severity of reaction. Is this an IgE mediated versus a non-IgE mediated food challenge that you're um, dealing with? Um, and typically doses are, 0.1 to 1 percent of the total challenge food, um, and if they, if you have a threshold dose that maybe in the past they've eaten a quarter of a teaspoon, or if you know that for some reason from a research study or something else, then you want to start below that. Um, and then, like I mentioned, in Europe they use really um, precise measurements and low starting points because they usually are challenging higher risk kids based on their um, criteria. Um, so other considerations I added in here, um, and I mentioned some of these along the way. You want to document that you um, went through verbal, and, and not just document, but you want to go through consent with the families, you know, the risk and benefits and document. And you want to let them know there are limitations, these subjective symptoms, you know, that you may call it an equivocal challenge if you can't really determine um, if the child won't eat the food. You know, there are some limitations to it that families should be aware of, too. And just practicality of it, of cost too, maybe something that I, I've started adding to some of my letters too, so that families can check on that beforehand. Um, making sure the day of, you know, that they're in good health, that they're allergic diseases, their asthma's not poorly controlled, or other things are, you know, even if they have a severe um, a eczema flare, you may consider rescheduling. Um, we'll go through meds, but discontinuing certain allergy meds, make sure they're prepared for a long visit. Um, and in general, we would like them to not eat four hours before, like I talked about the issues with gastric emptying, but young kids, maybe they can have a light meal two hours before the challenge because it's tough for them to go. I guess I'm on because I, I was trained and what I still do is I don't let them have anything after this water. All right. um, one thing is that for the little kids, it makes them hungry, so they're more likely to eat the food wherever you yeah. <laughs> um, And number two is that I still worry that if it was like two hours before, if they had something, you know, even though it's kind of like at the borderline of reacting, you know, you, there's always that thought in the back of your mind, was it something they had at home or something, or is it really the food? And if they're really going to have a reaction, if they already have a lot of stuff in their stomach, then are they going to aspirate and all the stuff they're vomiting up? And so I I'm more inclined to, yeah. you know, if a mom's breastfeeding or something like that, then that's a little different. But but um, for the most part, I'd like to have yeah. them like after midnight or something, because usually we start at eight in the morning usually. And that's typically, right, and that's typically what you say is don't eat that morning. You know, come in, and so that is what they end up doing. But it, it is tough for the younger one. But it, that has helped with some baked milk and baked egg challenges where they have to eat the muffin and it's tough to get through, but they're hungry so they eat it. Yeah. So the. Uh, so, he, and there's a good chart here and kind of what medicines you want to avoid. Hip, basically, it's antihistamines. Avoid your antihistamines like what we usually tell you. There's various times for based on the half-life of various meds, but, you know, five to seven days is a good rule of thumb. Um, you know, th they have on here leukotriene antagonists. I have not. I don't know if you've told them before. Um, Paul, so avoid uh, their singular, I typically don't, um, and their inhalers, really for me it's more checking to see if their asthma is poorly controlled or not. If they're using their albuterol, that means that probably they're having symptoms. Um, but, you know, maybe some of these other things would, may interfere with the challenge. Um, uh, for me it's more antihistamines and steroids. They even mentioned antidepressants on here, and I'm thinking, 
histamine tricyclic, because then maybe you won't have a good um, histamine response. But. I think more the the asthma is I think could be more that if someone I think I think of it more as someone who has poorly controlled asthma do you right. really want to induce some you know anaphylaxis someone who's poorly controlled asthma right. so if they can't go without you know the whole that stuff then right. really maybe they shouldn't be doing it right now but the long acting bronchial dilator you know if they take their morning simbacorp but they're otherwise well controlled like that would not stop me from doing a challenge. Um, they get, there's an example in here, and I have another one of peptides I couldn't find to pull in here of just kind of things that you want to document in your note, basically. You don't have to use this exact form, but, you know, you want to go through that morning. What was their previous reaction? Um, what, how were they treated in the past? Have they had anaphylaxis? What were their last skin and lab testing? Do they have any other food allergies? Um, if we're using a different vehicle, do they have any other illnesses, not just allergic, but other medical problems, and are they using other medications, just the basics, and then are they currently ill, when was the last message, it just kind of prompts you on the things you need to be asking, and doing a baseline exam. Um, special considerations, adults, <laughs> you know, pretty much <coughs> most of this is done in children, the studies are done on children, so we're extrapolating extrapolating all that to adults, so maybe that's why it is a special consideration. Um, but also elderly, I think, is more of a special consideration, that they may have a prodromal, you know, just saying, I'm not feeling so good, or malaise, or abdominal pain, maybe more vague before they get into a full anaphylaxis. Um, so, uh, other concomitant medications might be a factor, so acid blockers may decrease the digestion of certain proteins, maybe increases the severity of the reaction. Um, other patients, some patients have exercise-induced food allergy um, or food anaphylaxis, um, and there's no standardized protocol for this. If you wanted to do it, it might be difficult, but you eat the food and then 30 minutes later get on the treadmill. I think you might vomit from that, but uh, that is an option of um, doing that in the clinic. Um, aspirin or al alcohol, I don't know, but you know, other there are there have been reports of, of other factors um, with food causing uh, reactions. So monitoring and staffing. Um, so you want to get baseline vitals. You may consider peak flow respirometry too, um, and a baseline physical exam. You want to take a really good look at their skin, especially because especially in fair kids, you might get some bleeding erythema or positional. Um, so you want to really try to get a good handle on what their skin looks like. Even their turbinates, if they're probably an allergic kid, so they probably have some body turbinates from the get-go. You just want to kind of get a good um, handle on that. Um, if there's any asthma concerns at all, then you just wouldn't proceed with the challenge. Um, and you want to make sure you have your emergency medications and supply on hand. Um, so the emergency meds, um, I'll pull up later, but other things like oxygen, your um, blood pressure cuff, pulse ox, and then basically a crash cart, you know, if, if you're doing anyone with a, a history of severe reactions. You want to consider getting IV access. You don't automatically get IV access on all patients, but you consider on those who, um, like we mentioned before, are high risk. So severe asthma, they have a difficult access, or you're anticipating. So in our research studies, we're anticipating that these kids are going to react, so we may be more likely to do it. Um, and then there, you will, they want to be re-examined before each dose, of, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're not missing anything. And in our clinic, we have nice open um, windows where you can look in and, and the families can call us, but in some clinic settings it's not like that. You know, they're in a regular room and so you want to make sure you're reevaluating before each dose. In the wipes with water, sorry, mm -hmm. is that like you're wiping down where you cooked it? Your face. Oh, like so, kid's face. Mm -hmm. Got it. As opposed to a baby wipe. Like yeah, because sometimes you can get some irritant, yeah. you know, just some blotchy redness. Yeah. Is yeah. that truly, you know, reaction or not? So making sure you're just wiping off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first factor factor. sign of reaction, you want to examine them. You want to specifically look at, do a full skin exam, um, listen to their chest, look at their oropharynx. Do they have any edema? Are they tight? What are their vital signs? Is their pulse ox? dropping is their blood pressure stable, all those things. Um, you may want to do peak flow at that time. If they're having objective findings, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, um, you know, of a reaction, so they're having more than three hives, they are vomiting, they're having, um, you know, a drop in their blood pressure, wheezing, clear objective signs, obviously that's a reason to stop. 
subjective symptoms are the tough ones, you know, where they're saying my throat's a little itchy, my belly hurts a little bit. You can always observe and wait and see how um, they progress before you give the next dose. If, you know, if, they're, if their belly pain is worsening or if they finally vomit, you know, then it, it gives you a uh, reason to stop the challenge. Um, otherwise, you, you can continue. So some of the subjective symptoms, nonspecific pruritus, scratching, nasal pruritus, ocular pruritus, dyspnea without objective signs, throat tightness without any hoarseness or objective signs, um, nausea, abdominal pain, um, some type of weakness, dizziness. Um, so, so I like this chart a lot. We use it in the research studies, um, but it is very vigorous in how to score a challenge. So in the green, and I'm going to, um, everything's color coded. So the green is, is usually keep going. It's not an indication to alter dosing. The, um, it's not sufficient to call the challenge. The orange is caution. The dosing could proceed, but you may want to wait before you escalate. Um, if clinically indicated, dosing is stopped. So if symptoms are reoccurring or they're persistent, it's more indicative of a reaction than when you stop and they're just transient. Um, if you have three or more of these orange, it's likely to represent a true response. If you have any in the red, it's you stop. Um, so skin symptoms, so if just the mild occasional scratching, you may want to just observe. Um, if it's continuous hard scratching, that would be, um, you know, a warning. Uh, urticaria, so less than three hives, which is mild edema, you can maybe observe. If there's, you know, three to ten hives, or greater than three hives, significant edema, you know, you would stop. Um, and then it goes on about erythema, how to grade it, and then also for upper respiratory symptoms, how to grade it. If they have occasional sniffle versus intermittent rubbing and versus severe. Um, and then really the respiratory and laryngeal are pretty much a no-go. If you have anything, you would stop your challenge and treat. Um, the subjective complaints um, with the GI is difficult to get vascular drop in blood pressure, you know, mental status change, um, you would stop and treat immediately. It's tough with nonverbal children, so either, you know, autistic or young age. Um, so you have to, again, choose your um, patient carefully, but sometimes it is indicated you need to do it in some of these kids. So you want to watch for other signs, tongue grabbing, ear picking, even just a behavioral change. Not always, but I've seen that in some young kids. You probably have too. Um, that you can tell that there, you know, it's just a significant irritability, not just from being in the room. Um, change in, oh yeah, change in demeanor, withdrawn, field position. Older patients, um, so this is the elderly, like I was talking about, that might have some more vague symptoms too. Um, so when you're treating a reaction, um, you want to, you know, you want to get vital signs and continue to monitor that way, but it shouldn't impede you treating a reaction. You know, so we actually just had a shot reaction downstairs, and I would, I would have loved to get blood pressure and, you know, fat and everything, but we had the epi, we gave the epi right away, and then we got vitals. You know, it's just kind of practicality of it, too. Um, if it's a mild reaction, you know, based on either that chart or your observation observation of the patient, you can use an oral antihistamine. Um, but and then that's another lecture. Your you know diagnosis of anaphylaxis, um, then you want to immediately use um, IM epinephrine. Um, if you're using a second dose of IM epi, if they're having rebound symptoms, then obviously it's a severe reaction where they're going to need more protective um, monitoring and possibly even admission. So that's when you need to send them to the ER. Um, if they're having hypotension or even repeated emesis, you may need to start a line and give IV fluids too, because that's really your next step. And then for anaphylaxis, antihistamines or steroids are just adjunctive therapy. Those are not primary um, treatments. It's really the epi, and then if you go on to need a second epi, then fluids. Um, f hydroxy reaction, your first line treatment is really the IV fluids and then possibly steroids. I do a question mark of elevated the lower extremities because it used to be that you want to increase venous return, so you always put everyone in that um, Trendelenburg or you know raising lower extremities. But now it's questionable of whether you really need to or not, and you don't automatically have to put on oxygen. It's just things to consider. I think laying down the patient is a good idea if you're thinking anaphylaxis. It's easier to hold them, to administer the anaphylaxis, and just monitor them um, in that setting. There has been episodes, of, um, usually in older patients, that when they and then they have um, hypotension and um, syncope. Yeah, and ventricle system. Yeah, syndrome or something. Right. Like that. I couldn't think of the name of it. Ed Peds. Oh. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like 
um, where they actually as if they sit up really quickly or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, it's, I think it's called empty ventricle syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot the name for it. But yeah. We actually had this this Maggie who just took her board should know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like scary. decreased venous return. Mm -hmm. and like, no, I, I think just lying down supine is a good idea. I don't think you have to really raise your legs up, you know. Right, exactly. Uh, we have one in the adult side of, um, oh, sorry, I'm going over. Uh, this. That's okay. Okay. Um, so interpreting the outcome. So negative oral food challenge, um, which is the past, and, you know, some people like that terminology. Some, some families don't like pass or fail. They like the um, negative or positive challenge. Um, I think it's all confusing, so <laughs> how you say it. Um, the definition, so, uh, you know, they tolerate the entire challenge, including the mass and open purpose. Portions, you've observed them um, for the appropriate amount of time. If they need a longer observation for, you know, GI, so, you know, dysphagia for EOE or um, eczema flare, that's at home where they keep a diary. Um, for a positive oral food challenge, observation should just be two to four hours after symptom resolution. If it's mild symptoms that they had, two hours. So the anaphylaxis guidelines, I think the new one that just came out, but also in the office setting, even if you're giving um, an epi, two hours may be appropriate, but if it's anything else, you know, they have um, a second dose required or a severe protracted episode, um, you may want to um, observe longer, and that's when you're probably sending them off to the ER, too. You always want to caution families about biphasic reaction. You know, there's mixed literature about the steroids and whether it really prevents biphasic reactions, um, but you always want to warn them about that, that you've had an episode, in the next, especially in the next four to six hours, you're at highest risk. Make sure you're discharging them with epinephrine and a plan. Um, you want to make sure it's clear to the families. You'd be surprised some families don't don't understand that you're treating epinephrine. This is an episode of anaphylaxis and the risk associated with it and biphasic symptoms. Um, you may want to administer antihistamine before discharge. You're usually doing it anyways um, as you're treating the reaction, possibly the next day. And since you may have some recurrent urticaria over that first day, you may want to tell them to use it um, intermittently. I think it might mask symptoms, um, so I don't do standing doses of it. It's kind of as needed. Um, and then maybe they might have an eczema flare, too. I don't always um, mention this to families, but I think it's a good idea that they might have loose stools, you know, over the next 24 hours, and then obviously in reinforcing they need to strictly avoid be avoiding this food because they haven't had a clear fail and they're still food allergic. You want to follow up with them in 6 to 12 months and then go over, like I said, the emergency treatment plan and, and have, make sure to have epinephrine on hand. Um, for a negative challenge, so if they pass, um, I usually say, and most people I think say, refrain from eating the challenge food until the next day, because you're really observing for those delayed reactions too, and to call us if they are concerned for any delayed reaction. Um, and then they should be discharged too with an emergency treatment plan and an epinephrine just in case they are one of those ones who reacts at four hours. Unlikely, but it can happen. Um, uh, and then, yeah, just it, reintroducing the food into their diet and making sure you reiterate that they should be regularly ingesting it. Um, up to a quarter of patients, I, that was, I think that was one of my questions, mm -hmm. um, will not reintroduce the food into their diet after passing a challenge. One study had shown and um, that, you know, it just increases their risk of developing allergy. Again, if they continue to eat it in their diet, it fosters tolerance. Do you ask families before or when you're offering the challenge, like, mm -hmm. is it something that you think you can get the kid to eat after the challenge if they pass it? Well, I think those high. kids who are anxious are the ones who don't want to do the challenge to begin with. So yeah, they're the true. you know they're the ones who don't want to do the challenge and are probably less likely to to introduce it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's a good question. I don't routinely ask it. I kind of get the the feeling of whether they want to do the challenge or not. And as far as like having it regularly, I know for peanut and some foods that's mm -hmm. a little more defined, but for other foods, like yeah, what, what does that mean? I know. I think three times a week is reasonable. Okay. You know, if they can do that, I think that would be. Yeah. I don't know. Probably what about have things any like other? shellfish, like most yeah. people eat shrimp three times a week. Yeah, yeah. Should. I think I think the thing <laughs> is, I mean, there's for for peanut people have talked about this three times a week. I think, yeah, I think yeah. more that you would have it in your diet and you're not a specifically avoiding it. Um, so like with shellfish, you know, if, if someone's having shrimp, you know, 
couple times a month or something, I you know, I mm -hmm. think that would probably be reasonable right. because you're not going to be having it three times a week. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, the, um, the thing is that I, um, and it's, when we were setting up to do an oral challenge, it's, it's one thing for the parents want that to be off the chart so the kid doesn't have to sit at a special table, but um, you do have to ask them, you know, is this something that, you know, you're really, you're really, that you really want to have in this diet or not, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, when you're doing this, is a risk for anaphylaxis, number one, and just doing it. Right. Um, and, you know, if you go through all this stuff, is it something that's really going to be helpful for you as a right. family? Yeah, that I do discuss, um, though, yeah. The, um, the thing is, I cannot tell you the number of times when I've had kids, most of the kids that are like, you know, probably like five to eight or so in that range group, that like especially with penis stuff, they, they, you're trying to do the oral challenge and the kid's fighting the oral challenge yeah. because up until that point, right. the parents have said, before, you touch yeah. this, it's going to kill you. This right. Kill you. And then the parents can be like, okay, start eating today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, they well, mom wants me to die. You know, so it's yeah. a mind game. Yeah. And, they, and then the, I don't, can't tell you the number of kids will say, I don't care. I'm never going to eat this again. So I don't care if you're going to eat it, but I'll never eat it again. You know, <laughs> and so... So you think when they leave after that, you know, are they really going to introduce this into their diet at home? Right. No, you know. No. Well, that's why, you know, I try to get them young too. You know, I'm a little, I think I'm a little bit more brazen with that too because they, that mentality hasn't set in yet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always tell families with the train out question, you know, that there is that risk of cross contact, but their numbers are all, you know, negative. So if you're introduced, you know, interested in introducing, let's do it now, you know, and get it done. Obviously, it's a choking rest, so you have to pick what you use carefully, but, yeah. But um, when you do food challenge and you do enough of them, you'll just see the, the strangest things, <laughs> the kind of weirdest personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That really brings out the best of people. <laughs> um, okay. I think that's it. Well, so quickly on these, so we talked about how it's never an absolute contraindication, um, so that's false. Um, if you have a high concern for subject with bias, um, which, which one do you guys want to do? Double blinded. Mm -hmm. uh, typical observation is four hours. True. Mm -hmm. And then after a pass to challenge, 25% of patients don't reach you, so that's true. And then this is all picture of my little boy. Oh, I kept it in there. It's good memory. <laughs> one thing, just one thing about the double blind thing. I think sometimes we don't do it enough, but um, I think um, we have patients that we do. Um, uh, you know, we we do a lot of um, single blind um, challenges. The thing is that we have patients again, like we were talking about these kids who basically got in their mind that you know this is going to kill me, and so as soon as they get the, the first dose, of yeah. then they say, I have symptoms. Yeah. You know, right. you know. So for some of those kids that you anticipate they're going to be that anxious, I think you really should consider doing a couple placebo steps. Mm -hmm. So you just put in a, a, you know, you come up with some placebo of some yeah. sort, and you and you use that, and because like a lot of the stuff will mix, for some of the stuff you can, like for the, for you can get peanut flour, we have that in the clinic, you can mix in like applesauce, or something like that, but you could, um, when you, you tell them you're giving them small amounts, you're increasing it, you could give them a couple servings of just, you know, just applesauce, and if they are having reactions, then you know this isn't going to be successful. Right. You know? Talk about that. So they brought that on the paper, and I don't, I haven't done that clinically yet, like mixing in placebo doses. Um, so, you know, but then do you warn them of that? Because then afterwards you're going to talk about that with them, right, that they've yeah, had symptoms it, with placebo? Um, it, it, it depends on the situation. If it's a young kid and the kid's really anxious, then I may pull them on the side and say, we're going to, you know, we're going to, I'm going to do a couple of placebo steps, mm -hmm. um, just so you know, yeah. just see, because, you know, we know he's so anxious or something. Yeah. Um, I feel like the parents are really anxious and the kid, like, kind of feeds and Kill the kid. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's the same thing. And <laughs> we're gonna... The thing is, if you're something like that, then I think, then I think what you can do is just like we do with a peanut trial, you say, we're going to do two challenges. Uh -huh. One's going to be a placebo day and one's going to be the actual um, okay. you know, stuff day. The actual food day. And, That's how I like to do food and, and, Yeah, and do that. You know, on separate days because okay. then you're preparing them in, in advance. So they don't know one day one. is going to be. Yeah, they have no idea, so they are also worried about responding to placebo. Yeah, so yeah, so they're kind of. That's why I, I've done the separate days before, and I like that approach better. Um, yeah, we had a we had a, a patient, an adult patient. And uh, again, we usually don't do many oral challenges in adults, but this is a, no patients have saw us um, years ago at Truman who um, 
came in and she was one of these these holistic, um, you know, I only eat healthy foods, I have a perfect body weight, I have no body fat, whatever, and she was exercising 10 times a day and everything else. And she came in, and her concern was that every time she ate, she had a whole list of food, like 10 foods, okay. every time she ate food, within, within, within an hour, she would gain 10 pounds. You know, it was, it was this, she was this educated woman, you know, that, was, had, that had her own business and everything else, and she was, you know, she had to call all these problems, she gained all this weight and all this other stuff. So we had a we had a program. We did we did um, we told her we were going to do challenges. We were going to do we were going to do um, placebos as well. And so for like every clinic we had for like ten weeks in a row, she came in to do these challenges. And we put her on as as part of, besides doing the vital side. Did you we, um, we, No, we did we did we did put everything in capsules. Oh, you did. I oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, I didn't talk about capsules. We didn't talk about that. But yeah, they build capsules. You know, empty gel capsules. We used to get empty gel capsules. We Fill them in. So you start with like one capsule. Wow. By the end, you might be fit, doing 15 capsules or something. Yeah. But um, yeah. so, uh, we did placebo, and we did each one of those wow. capsules and stuff. And we had a scale, and so every time we did vital signs, we put around the scale. You know, oh my program. Gosh. We went through each one of Stop these, it. and for proof that she was, yeah, that she did have to wow. move. And even after we're done, she didn't believe it, and she wanted to do like, I said, no, that's enough. Oh you need to sleep like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's a good example. She's not going to change her diet now. Well, I've even done blinded inhalation challenges because some people will anaphylax, you know, with inhalation, especially if it's the flagrant things. Like, well, I did one in fellowship with cinnamon, and yeah. we did nose clips and then walked her into the room and blindfolded and had one time lots of cinnamon. It was very flagrant in there. And another time, none. And she didn't react either time. But it kind of just proved to her that you can be around this and you're fine. I had another girl who was admitted two times back-to-back -back for shellfish anaphylaxis. Her testing was negative by skin prick and by serum IG. I was like, I don't see how you are reacting. Just smelling this, let's do a blinded challenge. After that, they kind of stopped all their, because they were like, okay, we're not allergic. This is probably more VCD or anxiety or mm -hmm. something. And so yeah. probably went to psychiatry. <laughs> In one of those articles, do they have an outline for how to dose the additives? That's uh, for, uh, well, they have a chart in there for additives, yeah. and they, I think they yeah. do talk about vehicle, dosing in that in okay. the Novak. The vehicles is that separate chart I showed right. you, mm -hmm. um, but the additives they talk about sulfite, sonato, carmine, and okay. a few other things on there, and yeah. I think they give doses. Yeah, for the it. problem is it's hard to get those things. Yeah, um, and um, and the sulfites, uh, even when that was a big issue when I was a fellow. I've never done a sulfide challenge ever. I was surprised they had dosing on there. I was like, wouldn't yeah. those people react? Uh, um, yeah, and it's thought to be, you know, kind of, it doesn't really have much of an effect. Yeah. But the, um, San, Sammy Bama, Bana, um, who's in Shreveport, who's the program director there, um, he has a couple articles that he's um, that he's written on on um, food additives and stuff, and, I, and I, they have a scale. Is there a meeting? Tell us where it's no. late. But he has an article, and it has, like, dosing and stuff like that in it, too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Thank you, Dr. Nanda. I haven't done a food challenge yet. Food allergy in the that article. I'll try to get mom with the plate that is never called. I appreciate it. Thank you. Try to follow up with her or leave her alone. Maybe she can't find the place. Hey, buddy, how are you? Yeah, how are you? Yeah. I'm a man. 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 I